Well, thank you um, for coming. Welcome um, to today's talk. Um, I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Chris McCarty and uh, his talk on uh, how close is a cure to pain. Um, Dr. McCarty is professor and, I have to read this one, it's long, the Frank A. Duckworth Eminent Scholar Chair of the the Department of Medicinal Chemistry at the University of Florida College of Pharmacy. Dr. McCarty is also the Director of University of Florida Translational Drug Development Board and a Fellow and past President of the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists. Dr. McCarty obtained his BS degree in pharmacy from Ohio Northern University and his PhD in medicinal chemistry at the University of Georgia College of Pharmacy. His postdoctoral research was performed with the renowned medicinal chemist, Phil Portuguese, at the University of Minnesota. He was a faculty member um, of the University of Mississippi College of Pharmacy um, from 2001 to 2016, which is when he moved to University of Florida. Dr. McCarty's visit to Rowan is made possible by generous support from the Camille and on Okay, here I'm stumbling the same way. You, you did it, you pulled it off better. I don't speak any French. Henri, Henry, Dreyfus Foundation. The Dreyfus Foundation was founded in 1946 by Camille Dreyfus to honor her recently passed brother, Henry. Uh, both were highly influential chemists in early to mid 1900s with literally thousands of patents and massively successful industrial organization centered on the synthesis of, um, of synthesis of materials, uh, both synthetic and semi-synthetic materials. The purpose of the foundation is to advance the science of chemistry, chemical engineering, and related sciences as a means of improving human relations and circumstances throughout the world. And they do this by supporting researchers at many stages of their careers. So future chemists and chemical engineers Please be on the outlook for the opportunities that this foundation provides. This lectureship was awarded to discuss chemistry research relevant to addressing the opioid ep epidemic. Our speaker, Dr. Chris McCurdy, was chosen for this honor based on his innovative medicinal chemistry and pharmacology work and a longstanding record of successful mentorship. He has received research funding from NIH, including approximately 8 million in active, only active grant funding, NSF, CDC, AAPS, and USDA. And along the way, he has supported many postdoctoral researchers and graduate students. Uh, the graduate student, the current graduate stu student cohort includes a CSM alum um, who is currently pursuing a PhD degree in his lab. We would like now to welcome Dr. McCurdy and um, the talk on how close is a cure to pain. Thank you. Let's make sure we don't get feedback. Okay, it's a really a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank everyone uh, for attending. Um, you don't know what you're in for, so <laughs> hang on. Uh, but really, really excited to be back. I was here in um, 2019 previously, uh, before the pandemic, and uh, it's amazing how much has changed in that short time, uh, coming back to visit with you all. I want to thank um, Dr. Keck. I want to thank the Dreyfus Foundation uh, for this opportunity to be with you. And so yesterday I gave a talk that was much more geared toward the opioid crisis and a lot more chemistry based. Today, what I'd like to share with you is a story of work that we've been doing on a target that was much more uh, thought to be opioid based. Um, but it's now completely detached from opioids. Uh, but we'll talk about this, and we'll talk about how close are we actually to a possible cure for pain. So I want to start off just by orienting you with a case study. And this patient um, was a 54-year-old woman that came uh, to visit one of the physicians I collaborate with. And she was thought to just have this pain in her knee, she had very, very uh, severe pain. So much so that she said on a daily basis, it was about eight to 10 out of 10 on the 
on the pain scale. Uh, it had been going on for about five or six years, so she'd just been dealing with this. And she got to the point where she couldn't walk uh, really on grass. She loved to walk very well on grass. She couldn't walk down hills or down stairs. And she really couldn't even sit or stand without having severe pain. So she had several surgeries, uh, unsuccessfully helpful surgeries, some that did permanent damage, like where she had nerve ablation surgery done, which basically burns your nerve off and you never have it come back. Um, which they all helped and hoped uh, would cure the pain that she faced. I'm going to tell you the story of how we were able to um, actually cure the pain of this woman and uh, take you through the development of all the science that went behind this. Uh, and then share with you a couple other successful stories uh, towards the end once we've actually been able to um, change, change the lives of chronic pain patients uh, forever. So this has been pretty, pretty amazing. But let's start with framing what chronic pain is. And chronic pain is having technology that doesn't work. <laughs> Just a moment. Oops, now we're too fast. So the, the most common reason, really, for someone to seek medical attention is pain. This is the reason that people end up in the doctor's office, in the emergency room, in the urgent care, most frequently. And we do a terrible job of treating. We haven't really improved that much since, since the Civil War when we had ice, opium, hashish, and alcohol in our main energy. Still look at cannabinoid relief or medical marijuana treatments for pain. We still use opioids for pain predominantly. But a lot of individuals get pain relief from alcohol. But a physical pain and mental pain. So there's still those compounds that are being used. And it's been told to me at least that uh, ear piercing is still being taken with some ice on the ear and, uh, and people piercing their ears. So we still use all those anti antiquated treatments for pain. And chronic pain is really one of the largest diseases um, that we can deal with, affecting about 120 million Americans. Um, actually, more than the total that are affected by heart disease, cancer, and diabetes all combined. So pain is a really pervasive problem. And we've seen the opioid crisis really come up through this. And actually, uh, uh, unfortunately, the, the COVID pandemic made this even worse. And so overdose deaths have now exceeded 100,000 individuals in the United States for the first time. That number sounds impressive. It doesn't sound very impressive when we think about the COVID-related deaths that we've had. But if you do the math real quick, that's one person every five minutes dying in this country. So symptoms of chronic pain they range from numbness, tingling, um, just just that sort of when your arm falls asleep or your leg falls asleep. Uh, luckily, for most of us, that comes right back as soon as we get going, but a lot of these chronic pain patients will start out with that, without relief from that type of pain. Um, I think the numbers are a little bit uh, behind. So we look at about $635 billion annual cost in lost work days because of chronic pain. I would, I would venture to guess that this number is actually, in reality, closer to a trillion dollars. Um, and, and it's pretty substantial. And the current treatments that we have for uh, chronic pain are really based on anticonvulsants. So we use things like gabapentin or frontin or pregabalin. Um, these are compounds that uh, are originally marketed as anti-seizure medications. But what they do is actually do a nice job of controlling nerve fire so they can dampen the nerve signaling and then dampen the pain sensory information that comes through. And they're quite often used for post-surgical pain now, especially in the tiny area that the surgery was done. There's, there's millions of little nerve fibers in those areas, and this really helps to control some of that post-surgical pain. Unfortunately, it also comes with some side effects, some dizziness, and drowsiness, 
Uh, it's essentially working on GABA receptors in the brain. GABA receptors are the same part that the alcohol works on. And so you can imagine that um, you know, an elderly individual, uh, 70, 80 years old, that's having chronic pain and taking GABA drugs and not coordinated as it is. Uh, and then they decide, hey, I'm not even on some whiskey here tonight. They throw down a whiskey and now we've got an issue in terms of stability and potential fall injuries on top of the chronic pain that are there. If we can't control uh, chronic pain any longer with these anticonvulsant drugs, we move into the category of opioids. And then opioids, once you're there, it's hard to come off of those. And not just from the standpoint of treating the pain, but the physical dependence that develops. And so the physical dependence that develops from opioid treatment um, really becomes a problematic and sort of is the beginning of that cycle that we see with this opioid crisis. So the agents are happen for me, and in the case of opioids, like I said, we see physical addiction ability. So I want to show you like what are we what are we doing wrong? And give you a little quiz. Um, if you look at this, this is two patients, two individual patients. We're looking at their spine at the neck. Okay, so side view, like I'm standing now. <clears throat> and you can see on the left, this patient's spinal cord looks to be fairly uh, normal, not very compressed, whereas this spinal cord certainly looks to be not normal. And so the question is, which one is complaining of more pain? Well, I just said this one's abnormal. This one is normal. If anybody that read that MRI would say this patient is perfectly fine. But the bottom line is, both of these patients are complaining of 10 out of 10 cervical pain. So, what's going on, and why aren't we doing a good enough job to be able to look at this and say there's pain? We need to treat you on the right, just like we need to treat you on the left. Most physicians or radiologists will look at that image on the left and say, you're fine, there shouldn't be any pain, you know, go on about your day, I'm not going to give you any medication to treat this. We face that as one of the most common complaints with those that are coming into the clinical trials that we're running. And so I'll talk a little bit more about this as we move on. But the current imaging um, modalities that we have really lack sensitivity and specificity to hit small nerves to pain and origins of chronic pain. So the cold heart axis that scans are deceiving. <laughs> you know, we just saw that example of two individuals that have the exact amount of pain, um, and scans are more sensitive, they're more easily available than ever. You see mobile MRIs everywhere. Uh, but we're still not doing a good job at treating So what are we doing wrong? And how can we improve our ability to more accurately diagnose the sources of pain? Because if we can more accurately diagnose, then we should be able to treat. So I will introduce you to this class of receptor proteins called signal receptors. And this is something that we have been working on uh, for about the last 20 years in my laboratory, uh, and a lot has changed in 20 years. And if we go back almost 50 years to when these receptors were first discovered uh, at the University of Kentucky, um, they were actually first suggested to be a new opioid receptor. So the name Sigma goes along with the traditional opioid receptors, which are called new delta and kappa opioid receptors. The mu opioid receptor is the one where morphine binds, and it was a name morphine link of the group out of dreams of Morpheus. And the receptor that morphine binds to was given a brief nomenclature of mu or the morphine receptor. And so this is how those receptors started to be classified. And in this story comes along sigma, and where sigma came from is the fact that. They were testing new compounds from Smith Line and Crunch Pharmaceutical Company that were thought to be opioids. And they put these into a dog, and the dog had a behavior that they never seen before with any drug. 
And they couldn't reverse that behavior with um, known opioid antagonists. So the dog became very aggressive and very agitated. So they thought, oh, we've identified the receptor. This is how we identified the receptor, by the way, in the 70s, with all the pharmacological treatments in animals. We didn't have any idea that the receptor for proteins really existed. Now we have sophisticated techniques where we can first of all, what was first thing. We visualize them computationally. Um, but before that, we did all with the problem. So as things went on, this was uh, oh sorry. <laughs> the sigma name came from the Smith, the Smith by the French drug company. And so that's where they just came up with Sigma. We have a joke as chemists, uh, one of our major chemical suppliers is used to be Sigma Aldrich, and now it's known for Sigma, but the Sigma name is still there. Um, and this protein is a very promiscuous protein, it binds lots and lots of plastic chemicals. And so we used to joke around that it would be a particular catalog because anything you buy in there will bind to this protein. And to some extent, that's true. <laughs> um, and sadly, that has put us into what we call the sigma and enigma cycle over the last 50 years because so many dirty compounds. So many classes of compounds, even marketed drugs, have incredibly high affinity or interactivity with these proteins. Yet we blame the activity on something like a dopamine receptor or a serotonin receptor or opioids. Yet many of the antipsychotic drugs that we use, interestingly enough, act with, interact with uh, this protein. And that's interesting when you think about that extra activity that happens in the dog with being. Sort of agitated and irritable, um, that we, we could probably treat mental disorders with some, something targeting these. And that was indeed the case. The, the pharmacology shifted. There was a belief that these bound to benzyclidine receptors or angel dust PCP receptors on NMPA important uh, receptor complex. Later, that was proven to be wrong, and the proteins were finally cloned. And this proved that they existed. One of the biggest things we ran up against submitting grants was the fact that these proteins don't exist. So we call them, you guys, this is all in your head. So this whole story about the pain being in our head uh, really resonates with me to the spot, that sort of mental pain of trying to get funding for all this work for a long time. We do now have crystal structures of both of these sigma receptors. So the sigma receptor later got classified two subtypes, sigma one and sigma two. Um, and now that we have the crystal structure available, we can actually do some more rational drug design and look at what these things look like uh, in, in the legal system beyond the table. Okay, they exist. We know, we love them. Uh, <laughs> we, we also know that they exist very deep within the cell. They're expressed almost everywhere in the body. And they're expressed in almost every species that's on this planet, including plants and fungus. In fact, it has the most close relationship to a fungal protein than it does any mammalian protein. And so if you think about that, if we go back to single cell organisms, fungus, this is actually coming back to something that's an archaic receptor. It's been around since some of the first single cell organisms on the planet probably, and it's evolved with us um, into where it is now. It was a sterile isomerase enzyme and fungus. It has no sterile isomerase activity in, in humans or in mammals, but it still binds steroids. And so we don't know what the real function of this receptor is. It's believed to be a chaperone protein. So we actually think, and I'll show you on the next slide in a little more detail um, of what's going on here, but we believe it's chaperoning something from the intracellular storage compartments up to the cell surface uh, for, for utility. It, this is a crystal structure of the sigma-1 protein it is existing as a trimer, so three monomeric subunits that are identical come together to exist as this one oligomeric structure. <laughs> And this is how it was crystallized. It's thought in the literature that it can exist as a monomeric unit all the way up to 
large uh, combinations of oligomers, so many mers. <laughs> um, it does have a role in regulating intracellular calcium support. And so we know that the mitochondrial associated membrane and the plasma particulum, it will mediate um, an acetyl triphosphate receptor calcium activity. And so if this receptor is activated, calcium levels inside the cell will change. Calcium levels inside the cell will then affect many the other things that can happen. But this uh, receptor itself seems to move, as I mentioned, from those intercellular stores as a single monomeric unit all the way up to the cell surface and somehow recombines itself into a multiple. And then we think it has protein-protein interactions with various targets. This is one of the great mysteries in cell biology. So if somebody is really anxious to make a mark in the cell biology area, this is an area I think that has been totally ignored and we need help. We also know that we uh, see that these proteins are chaperoning or carrying a molecule of cholesterol to the surface. And what we believe is happening in that case, and this is totally hypothetical, we have no solid evidence to show this, but what we believe is happening is that cholesterol molecule is then able to be released next to a protein and then stabilize the activation of that protein in one way or another to make that protein more efficient. So what we see in general when we have compounds that are activating something like a dopamine receptor, like dopamine itself, it also activates the sigma receptor and causes it to translocate and then interact with the dopamine receptor and make dopamine receptors more efficient in their signaling processes. So it gets very confusing as what really is going on. Um, and there's a great science paper, nature paper here, if somebody figures it out. So that was a quick overview of what's going on there. But many disease states have a merge that are associated with signal receptors. And there's a list of them here. Most of them are all central nervous system disorders. Um, many of them we've already mentioned, like uh, schizophrenia or depression and anxiety, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. There's some belief that there's a utility for these and uh, multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's disease. And we have, uh, we have combinations of uh, research programs going on in all of these areas, really trying to collaborate with people that can see what the role is of these compounds in, in these diseases, what is working in these diseases. I highlight the two at the bottom, uh, chronic pain and drug addiction, because these are the areas that we are directly most passionate and most focused in. Uh, these are also expressed in cancer cells, and there's a whole body of literature looking at the utility of different compounds targeting these proteins to treat, to treat cancer. We have collaborations in that area too, but um, I don't have much to talk about in terms of any of these other disease states today. Um, so what, what happened along the way, and how did we get an understanding or a better understanding of this protein? I mentioned to you before that all of these compounds that were available and that were tested in the past were very dirty, interacting with many other proteins. Uh, and there was really no good selected compound that only found to the signal one protein. So when I started my career, we made this molecule. Um, and this is uh, all the way back to 2005 when we published it. But this molecule is very simple. Small molecule. Turns out it happened to be one of the most selected compounds for this protein that had ever been discovered. And we had sent it through a battery of 200 other CNS drug targets, and we don't see affinity of those targets. And so, what these affinity numbers mean here the lower the number, the better. This is not correct at all. Uh, so, 0.56 nanomolar is a really high affinity binder to this protein target. And we can see in the other sigma subtype, it's greater than 1,000. So there's a great deal of selectivity, even between the two sigma subunits that we're talking about. So I was at a meeting in the American Chemical Society in San Francisco, and we were presenting the work that I just showed you in a poster. And this gentleman walks up to me and says, 
hey, what do you think about putting a fluorine on your molecule so we can potentially turn it into an imaging agent? And so that sounds interesting, but I don't know anything about agents or, or diagnostic agents for that. Event. And he said, well, no problem. We can take care of that part. You do the chemistry, put a fluorine somewhere on this molecule. So go back to the lab and we put a fluorine on this molecule. So that's the F you see on the right side. To our surprise and to our great uh, happiness, I guess, <laughs> we ended up increasing the affinity of this compound even greater from 0.56 to 0.0025 nanomolar. This is not an uncommon phenomenon to see when you add fluorine to a molecule because fluorine is more electrophilic, it's more electronegative, but it's also the only halogen that can participate in adding one to the other. So the fact that we stuck this on the end of the scale means that there's something in the receptor protein that that scale is reaching out and binding to more efficiently. Unfortunately, we also increased the affinity of the other time which made us very nervous about straining it through the entire CNS receptor line. But if we look at the selectivity, we actually improved on the selectivity uh, for sigma one over sigma two. And luckily we were a thousand fold selective over every single target um, in the central nervous system that we could monitor for. So this is just stupid luck, right? <laughs> it's great, but it all tells you a story about being in the right place at the right time and recognizing it and trying to take advantage of it. So this was a great story for one of our grad students because he came back and we worked on making this fluorinated compound, sent it off, it was even better. He's like, wow, my dissertation will be cool now. Uh, <laughs> we got this great story. And we ended up getting nice patents with this material as well. So there's a couple of interesting moieties, sample one of these here. And I promise there won't be too much chemistry, uh, but I can't that happens. So there's a seven member nitrogen containing ring on the top of this molecule. We call that an azepane ring. That's not a very usual ring system that you see in drug molecules. Uh, it's absolutely one key element that we think is giving us the selectivity for this protein. And then we have a benzothiazolone uh, heterocycle at the bottom of both of these. And these are really thought to be uh, crucial binding elements as well. And then, of course, the fluorine seems to be the magic dust. So synthesis, and I won't, this is, this is just for the benefit of all the chemists that came to do it. So <laughs> um, the synthesis is incredibly easy. That's the other thing I just want to underscore by showing you the synthesis. We buy commercially available benzodiazolone, we do a pre isolation reaction on that. We do a um, reduction to remove that carbonyl next to the aromatic ring. Uh, and then we do an Appel, Appel reaction, uh, which converts that chlorine to a fluorine. And then we finally alkylate with um, this uh, bromoethyl uh, azepane. Very simple, very straightforward chemistry. The kind that you you just can't imagine makes graduate students incredibly happy. Now, there's a whole, whole other story to this. Was can we take, retain the selectivity and the binding profile with the fluorine added on the molecule? And then now we have to transform that fluorine, which was not radioactive, into a radioactive fluorine, so it can serve as a positive transmitter and positron emission to monitor. So this is Fred Chin, and Fred was that chemist that came up with me the day of ACS uh, meeting in San Francisco, and he was at the time the director of the cyclotron, uh, which creates these radioactive molecules that stand for. And he was the head of, of that facility, and part of his project was making radio tracers for Stanford Medical Center uh, every day, and then the rest of the day, once he was done with his clinical duties, he could play with research. So this was one of the research projects we took on. That is a cyclotron pictured uh, behind him. Um, the walls around that have to be three foot thick concrete. Uh, and then just about everything around it is wet. Uh, so this is generating um, 
radioactive material, not like a nuclear reactor, but what happens is we pump oxygen into this system, we have the oxygen, it goes through this machine and it kicks out certain materials within that molecular oxygen that turn it into fluorine and it becomes a F-18 version. Fluorine is only F-19. And so F-18 is a radioactive positron emitter that we can now capture in a detector the emission of those positrons. Unfortunately, as well, we had to change its synthesis because fluorine has a problem in that it only has 190 minutes half life radioactive fluorine. So as soon as this molecule is synthesized, it starts to degrade um, and, and go away. So you really have to make these molecules very close to patients that you're going to put them into. So we had to put this fluorine now on at the last step of the synthesis instead of in the middle of the synthesis where we did it uh, before. So this was just some of the changes that we had to do just after the pre-op process of ratio reduction. Instead of doing that full reaction, we um, protect that. And then do that operation. We remove that protecting group to expose the alcohol. That alcohol is turned into a tosylate. Tosylate is an extremely good leading group where we can just do a nuclear focus mission of forming at the very end. And then we have our material that then goes through HPLC purification. And what happened to me? Uh, okay, there we go. HPLC purification and it's actually GMP grade material can go into humans at that point. So we, we've got that all set up and figured out. This is not a human, but this is Jane. This is a monkey. This is a monkey. Squirrel monkey, sorry. Let's try it. So this is the squirrel monkey that we did some of the first uh, work on. We started with mice, we went to rats, um, and then we went to monkeys. Because monkeys can give us a much better distribution picture of where this compound is going in the body. This is just pictures of the head. Obviously, you see that uh, we're looking straight on in the coronal version, so you're looking straight at, at the face in the sagittal, you're looking at the side, and traverse is really just a cut through uh, from front to back. And so we can see uptake of this compound in particular brain areas. And so as the color is more red or orange, we have higher uptake or higher um, concentrations of that positron emitter in those areas, indicating high concentrations of the receptor protein itself. So. <clears throat> so what was sort of validating to all the targeted or associated pathologies is that we see there's a tremendous amount of the CMOR receptor expression in prefrontal cortex. This is a great sort of connection already to Alzheimer's, learning memory, um, other uh, mental issues. And then we have a huge amount of uptake in the midbrain, in the reward center, and also in um, motor sensory areas. And so, this was all sort of reconfirmation that we are connecting to the outside sensory parts of our body to these very important centers inside of our brain that process all that information. So with this, we were very excited and Stanford got really, really lucky in uh, 2013 or 15, they were actually able to install the very first in the world multimodal imaging detection system that could record positron emission and MRI at the same time. And I think everybody's familiar with MRI. Um, and MRI gives us this beautiful, very nice detail of soft tissue as well as bones. And it does a very poor job of sensitivity for molecular imaging. So when you combine MRI and PET together, you sort of get the best of both worlds. And you should be able to not only see those high concentrations of, of um, uptake, but now you should see exactly what tissue that uptake is. So this is a really cool 
confirmation, and this is the same pictures with Jane, they're a little hard to see because of the lighting. Um, but now we can actually go in and drill into the specific areas like the cerebellum and the hippocampus and the different areas that we can definitely point, pinpoint exactly where this compound is going. And I'm taking back a step to the mice because we talked about how selective this compound is in binding profiles. And you gotta understand that when we do the binding profile, all those targets are ones we know about. There's still many, many targets in the brain we don't know anything about, and we don't screen them. So one thing that we really wanted to do was see how selective this was if we injected it into a mouse, and then we blocked it. So we did that, and you can see high uptake in the mouse. You see you lose almost complete definition. It's just everywhere in the brain. If we block it with haloperidol, this is an anti a uh, psychotic agent that has highest affinity for small receptors. This is really not even the package <laughs> um, But it blocks the single one receptors, and we can see that there's almost no color uh, in those slides. So then we wanted to do it in a genetic knockout mouse where the single one receptor protein is knocked out, so we shouldn't have any uptake at all. And we should really just see if there are any selectivity issues, and we can see. At the bottom is basically looks like when we blocked the sigma one receptor. So this is an exquisitely selective molecule uh, in vivo. So what about sigma one receptor in pain? And how does this work? We think, and none of this is really figured out. As I said, the cellular pathways are not well figured out. But we think what's going on is we see that sigma one receptors, from an observational standpoint, can modulate opioid analgesia. So we can actually give lower doses of opioids um, and block tolerance development with sigma receptor antagonist. This has been targeted as an adjuvant therapy for current opioid use um, and in a way to reduce the amount of opioid that can be prescribed. This, is, this concept is playing out right now in Spain in clinical trials. Um, and so not our compound, but uh, one of our, one of our colleagues in that area is really playing that out. We do know it increases NDA receptor responses and it modulates ion channels, particularly uh, potassium and calcium channels. We already heard about how it inter interacts with calcium storage inside the cell. It also affects calcium channels. I'm sorry, <laughs> potassium channels. And potassium channels are one of the main targets for a lot of the analgesic development that's happening uh, right now. It also is an anti-drug target because this is the hurt channel on the heart, the potassium channel. If we're interfering with the conductance in the heart tissue, you can cause cardiovascular problems, heart attacks, and deaths. So we have to be cognizant of this as well. In all of this, we see modulation of um, synaptic plasticity. We see changes in long-term potentiation, spinal sensitization, and modulation of neurotransmitters. All of those things are tied to pathological pain. So this seems like a target that should be uh, a viable one for pain. And if we look at the nerve a little bit closer, when a nerve is damaged, we get Schwann cell activation of that nerve. So the nerve injury occurs, we'll start to see Schwann cell activation. That is turned well, start attracting cytokines. Cytokines will also activate the macrophages to come in. Uh, you can really think of Schwann cells as sort of the macrophages of the nervous system. Um, and all of this leads to a great proliferation of Schwann cells around the nerve damage tissue. Those Schwann cells then overexpress signal one as a target protein, which now we can take advantage of with our targeted again as a biomarker to find where the nerve damage. So we did this first in the rat model, where we take the rat and we do uh, an induction of sciatic nerve injury. This is called a, a chronic, um, I'm sorry, spared nerve injury model, uh, where we take the sciatic nerve, expose it, we go down off the spinal cord to where the sciatic nerve breaks into three branches. Two of those nerves are tied off, one is left intact. And the two nerves that are tied off essentially now turn into that chronic pain numbness, high sensitivity, and we can now measure pain 
involved with, with that. So what we wanted to do first before we measured the inch pain was can we, since we know exactly where we put the nerve damage, can we prove this hypothesis that the swan cells are coming overpopulating that nerve damage area, expressing a higher amount of signal receptor? Can we light up that spot where we induce damage? And what you can see here is we have this poor rat that has his nerve damage. And the point is not working, but on the very top picture, the far right, you can see a orange glow. Below the big one, below which is the kneecap. Um, but you can see that there, uh, circled in red. Then, as we drop down to the next level, uh, you can see where the white arrow is, hopefully. That's pointing and pinpointing to exactly where that damage was. We did a pre block, just like we showed in those brain images where we gave haloperidol first. We blocked the uptake at that site in the animals. We did a sham animal, which actually had the Surgery where we cut open the leg, exposed the sciatic nerve, but we did not damage the sciatic nerve, healed that animal back. So we're looking here for residual surgical inflammation or any other damage that could have occurred from the surgery. Uh, and then the control animal is the lucky guy that just is uh, <laughs> and have nothing happen to it. But we were able to really pinpoint where this nerve damage was. We um, then did ex vivo autoradiography where we went through and removed sided nerves from these racks. And then we did uh, a bath with this radioactive compound in there to look and see if the uptake was specifically on that nerve tissue that we thought it would be. And you can see on the bottom uh, row there that we, we were successful in that. So we felt very confident moving forward that we could at least find where nerve damage um, and what does that really mean? Okay, if we find it, at least we know where to start looking for targeting treatment. But what was really cool was there were data starting to emerge that single line antagonists could actually serve as analgesics themselves and reverse the chronic pain. And so what this shows you here is actually a study that we did with these, um, this was in mice, but the same exact injury that we induced the rat. Uh, and now we're using what's called a long bracket assay, which is pretty standard uh, for looking at pain sensitivity. And the long bracket movement is a needle, uh, really, it's a piece of wire with different strengths. And so some of the wires are, are really flippy floppy, some of the wires are really stiff. And so we, we insert pressure into the animal's paw that's healthy, and we see how well they can take that pressure to the and then we'll take the paw off, and then we'll also inject um, or, or subject the, the paw on the leg that's been injured to that pressure, and generally they will pull their paw much faster. What we can do is look at pharmacological manipulation of that, if we can dampen that sensitivity and that pain, um, and, and see how that plays out. So as we move up in on the on the uh, On the, on the axis there up to 100, that means we're getting up to full sort of analgesic efficacy. Okay, we're comparing this to gabapentin. Gabapentin is the gold standard that I talked about a lot as in the clinic. And so we see that it's performing very, very well in the green line. And then there's our compound dose dependently as we go up to those, we can match the efficacy of gabapentin in this animal model for analgesic relief. So this was exciting to us too, because it was like, okay, we have a way that we might be able to diagnose the pain and with the same molecule of radioactive, <laughs> we can treat the pain. So this falls into a category of, of things that are being developed now called theranostics, the therapy and diagnostics work together and we have theranostics. We also were very concerned though, because gabapentin, as I mentioned, will cause sedation, will cause animals to fall. And we use an assay called the rotor rod assay, where essentially we have mice on a rotating rod, and you put the mouse on there, it's gonna stay on that rod and run and keep itself up. If you give them a drug that causes them to sedation, it's, it's funny to watch, but it's really funny, they, they just roll off, okay? 
Let's go where they get past this week. They're better than I guess they jump off the bed. <laughs> so what we see here is um, the ability for them to maintain that view, which indicates that they're not getting sedation or any loss of coordination. Um, and as we increase our dose of our compound, which is here in purple, uh, you can see that it, it doesn't seem to have uh, much of effect on sedation. We use U5488, which is a kappa opioid receptor agonist. That's the orange uh, dots that you see there. Kappa opioid receptor agonists are known to cause sedation, so this is a positive sedation control. AT66, that's up there as well, is a whole other story that we don't have time to get into today, but you can see it causes a pretty large sedation. Also, we, we definitely felt good about seeing less type of sensitive side effects. Now the question is, if these drugs are pain relievers, do they have drug seeking behavior or addictive qualities or properties associated? So in order to do that investigation, we looked at an assay called um, condition place reference. And this is where you put animals into essentially like a shoebox. There's a vestibule in the middle of the shoebox, and then there's two different environments on the left and on the right. Um, and those different environments could be horizontal straight black and white walls versus vertical black and white stripe walls or texture differences on the floors. You isolate the animal to one side of this apparatus, you give them something like morphine, um, and then when you give them the opportunity to be reintroduced to that apparatus, they go back to where they got morphine because they're not. I felt good with it. Here, let's see if we can't find that feeling again. We can also look at aversion. So if we have a drug that causes them to hallucinate or feel really bad, they will avoid being in that compartment and go to the other side. So that's what we see here when blue is morphine. That will cause a condition place preference very strongly. And we see that kappa agonist as well causes sedation, but kappa agonist also causes dysphoria. So the opposite of the euphoria you see with mu agonist, and the animal stays in the opposite side of where they got drug. So this is a great positive and negative control for us to look at. And then as we look at our compounds across the baseline here, you can see we're not really seeing any statistical difference from just choice of which side they want to be in, indicating this should not have drug abuse potential. This was underscored even further with work that we did with Dr. Katz at the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Our original funding in this project was to find compounds to treat cocaine addiction. What we found is they don't work. But in that process, we were looking at can these compounds substitute for cocaine or can they block cocaine self administration and inhibition? What we know is in all the ways that we tried, we can never get animals interested in trying to take this molecule, um, indicating that it really has no use potential. This is the gold standard sort of assay to look at for drug abuse. Uh oh. This tells me I'm done. Okay. So, with all that sort of background, um, we were able to move ourselves into human clinical trials with FDA approval in 2015. Uh, as I mentioned, this was the instrument that was installed at Stanford. And this is another just stupid luck happening. But GE Healthcare created this instrument. GE Healthcare sold this instrument to Stanford. And in return, they offered grants to Stanford investigators to produce images from this instrument so that the GE Healthcare could go out and sell more instruments. We were a fortunate recipient of one of those grants that has funded our entire phase one clinical trials. Um, and so this was the very first patient um, that, that we got there. I had a lot less gray hair uh, in 2015, um, but I was standing there just very nervous that a chemical I made is finally going into a human. And I was scared to death something was gonna happen to this person. Uh, and then the radiologist is standing to my left He's standing there with his arms crossed and he's very angry. He said, This is where we fail. I said, What do you mean? He said, Well, first images come up 90% of the time with new compounds. I would be scared. 
campus and I asked a stupid question like that. <laughs> and, and he said, Well, where is Florian? Oh, it goes into the bubbles. <laughs> so if the molecule is not stable in the human system, that fluorine comes off, it immediately goes into the skeletal system. And the first image that you see in majority of the time of these new compounds is the skeleton. So he is like, ah, this is a waste of time. <laughs> not really. This was the images that came out, those first, that first patient. And so uh, there's a lot of high fires. <laughs> uh, but this was exactly what we were hoping to see. And so what you can see here is uh, uptake of the compound in a lot of tissues, right? You see in the lungs, hopefully you can identify the lungs, the liver, the kidneys. Um, we see it uptake in the brain, we see uptake in the thyroid, we see it in the heart, and I'll show you some of the PET MR images in a moment, um, which are going to be really hard to see in here with the light. But uh, this is what we want no skeleton until we start to get to the two hour time point, and you really start to see some of the spine. Uh, and you, know, you can start to see it one hour, and then the pelvis becoming more pronounced. But those were not really what we were concerned about. We were most concerned about peripheral limbs and being able to visualize any uptake to any nerve damage that would be out in the periphery. Yeah, sorry. This is the PET MR image. And when I was first giving, showing these talks, it was really fascinating because there's very few people that have even still seen these types of images. Um, where you have both the pet and the human and the MRI. And now you can start to see the exquisite detail, right? You can see, I'll just talk about the bright lights, particularly the second image on the top row. You can see the adrenal cortex and the kidney beautifully expressed and taken up. We see heart tissue. We know there's a huge amount of semen receptors in the heart tissue. And then you see the brain lit up very well. And so, um, we asked all these patients not to eat prior to the studies. They had to fast and then come in in the morning. We busted this guy, he ate breakfast. <laughs> because you can actually see food uh, expanding the intestine uh, in here. So, what happens is sigma receptors are in every metabolically active tissue. And so, metabolically active tissue will take up the tracer, just like we want to see. So this makes it difficult if we really want to start looking at changes in brain tissues, if we really want to start looking at changes in kidney or liver or heart, we really have to have a good algorithm to do that. But you still don't see anything in the peripheral nervous system. So I bring you back to this case study of this woman that had all these failed surgical procedures and whatnot and failed uh, normal MRIs. So she was subjected to our Tracer, and what you can see here is it lit up in the middle of her knee. Uh, and this was the first time in many years that she had anything positive to say about the physician. <laughs> uh, and what we did was then talk to her surgeon, and her surgeon decided, What do I got to lose? I've already burned off her nerves and that other thing. But we're going to go in there and we're going to check this out uh, a little more closely. And they went in and cleaned it out. What they found was something you could never find on an MRI unless you knew exactly where you were supposed to look. There was a small notch of bone that was pressed into her nerve that was causing everything. So, because of this, they were able to go in there. <clears throat> they uh, shaved that area off, cleaned it up, and 30 days later, she said, I can sit and stand with no problem. I walk down the hills, I walk on the grass. I haven't tried to go downstairs yet, but I walk normal. A lot has changed. That was 30 days. Six months later, the pain is gone. I do physical therapy for a few months. I have not had to take any medication for my knee since recovery from my surgery last fall. Since, you know, six years, since this started six years ago, this is a big deal. Absolutely. I was like, if anything else happens in my career, it's just I see my kick, right? And at 18 months post-operative, 
she sent an email to the physician and said, well, let's you not know and my leg is back to normal. So she was able to rebuild all that muscle mass that she had lost from not being able to walk on it for six years. Uh, and she said, this is just great. I'm so glad I found your study. Then this one is really cool. We haven't, we just submitted this paper. Um, this is a 37 year old man who had a reconstructive ACL surgery had meniscal tears repaired um, and then left. And after surgery was complaining of more pain than before surgery. And so what was happened was uh, he came to our trial, we imaged him, and we could see on the top on the top panel, you can see uptake underneath the kneecap here. This is a place called Hoppus Pad. And uh, I don't know why it's called Hoppus Pad, but anyway, it is. I don't know if it's related to Jimmy uh, or what, but um, this area was was overexpressing skin receptors. And where he was complaining of the pain. They showed it to his surgeon. The surgeon refused to operate any further and said the pain's all in their head, according to the patient's report. They told him to go on. Luckily, being at Stanford, they were able to show another surgeon and say, what do you think? And he said, what do we got to lose? Let's try and do it. So they were able to go in and surgically remove this tissue that was inflamed. And this is one of the first reports where we were able to get the patient to come back after surgery and then he said again, and that's the bottom picture that you see where all that update is gone. All his pain is resolved, he's returned to normal as well. So this has been another really cool story in the, in the whole uh, long essence of it all. I will tell you this very quickly because I know we're at the hour, um, but we started to work with UC Davis they have a, a thoroughbred horse colony that are retired thoroughbred racing horses because of lameness or leg injuries. Um, and we've been able to uh, work with their vets and actually image horses that were lame. Uh, we've been actually able to look at and find in non-conclusive studies specific areas of nerve damage in those horses. Uh, we injected this particular horse with lidocaine uh, right into that neuroma area, and that horse, for the first time in a few years, walked normally for about 20 minutes and said the lidocaine wore off, and then the horse was back into being lame. Unfortunately, this horse passed away of natural causes uh, not too long ago, and I don't have time to show you all the the videos of before and after injection, but it's it's pretty it's pretty neat to watch. And there's a lot to describe in those videos to show you the behavioral changes. Uh, so we won't go into that, um, but I'll try to wrap up and tell you that we think we've developed a very highly selective tool that can be utilized as a diagnostic uh, to really monitor um, nerve damage and chronic pain. Uh, we also have completed over 150 patients with scanning, showing no changes in clinical chemistries, no problems. With the, with the compound. Um, we're in the process right now of a company licensing all of this material out and hopefully carrying us into phase two, phase three clinical trials and hopefully to the market. Uh, there's a text about all that right now. <laughs> Tiny. Um, but the, the one thing that I think is really fascinating about this, and the cost is totally prohibitive at this point. But the fifth vital sign you have is pain. And so when you go in to see a physician, they check your blood pressure, check your weight. Yeah, they do all of those normal vital signs, your temperature. But now they ask you how you feel. On a scale of one to 10, what's your pain today? My 10 could be a one for someone like Dr. K. But, but um, you know, it's a very subjective thing. There's no way to quantify that, that pain measurement or diagnosis. And so we think that this could be a way, way out in the future, to scan patients to see if they're truly suffering from some sort of neurological pain or uh, injury pain. And uh, a 
place and the cost will have to come way down. But this would be another way of looking at curbing the opioid epidemic because many of these individuals are coming into emergency rooms seeking drug treatment for pain. And if the physician could just throw them into the scanner for an hour and come out and say, okay, yeah, you really need some pain medicine, you go to the or, you know, we don't know. Uh, that's kind of where we're hoping to get with all of this. So um, we don't think there's abuse potential with this as a therapeutic. We think that it will be uh, pretty efficacious. Um, and I guess I'll leave it there just to tell you this. This story and thanks for giving me the time and attention to tell it. Happy to do Um, we do. Uh, it's it's it is so. What's funny about it is it was predicted through structural prediction softwares. It was predicted to do to be a two transmembrane spanning domain protein with uh, extracellular loop and intracellular tails, right? But when it was actually crystallized. It looks like this trimer that doesn't really have extracellular <laughs> domain. Yes. And so what's happening? We know that the binding is happening on the intracellular side. And I don't have a picture to show you exactly where those are docked, but if you if you have the ability and you have the interest, um, there's several uh, crystal structures in the protein database with ligands docked in them. Uh, so you can actually see agonists and antagonists. And there's really not much different in the binding, uh, the way they look. Uh, so this has always been a mystery to us still. Um, and we'll figure it out. We don't know if, we don't know what's happening, but I'll tell you this, an antagonist stabilizes the multimeric form. An agonist causes the multimeric form to dissociate into monomeric units and move and translocate from the center, from the intracellular compartment. How they then find themselves back at the subsurface, mystery, where they're binding compounds, what they're doing. <laughs> That's why I said if somebody wants to do cell biology, this is a wide open moment. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? That's a great question. So the question is, how do we think this could impact insurance um, coverage or reimbursement and, and all these aspects? So uh, before I tell you that answer, I will tell you that that will be the biggest hurdle for us to get this on the market. So um, there was a there's an imaging agent that was approved by the FDA and then was not approved for reimbursement by CMS except for veterinary services. Um, and it died after an FDA approval. So we have to get through the next two phases of clinical trials, get to uh, FDA approval, and then hopefully get approved by the government for reimbursement of insurance. Now comes the question, how is this going to impact treatment and things going forward? And it's a really good question. I don't know. Will, will it be a positive in the aspect that somebody's got injury, now we can see exactly where the injury is, we can do a much better job of treating them instead of having to go through this long run of chronic pain scenario where we can't find what's wrong with them? Insurance companies may be much more happy to say, let's try this first. Let's go in and if we can surgically manipulate it, let's do that. Um, and if it's successful, then the person's quality of life is good and they're on. And the insurance company is going to save millions of dollars in the long run. On the flip side of that, <laughs> what if it doesn't work? 
uh, in many cases? What if it actually predisposes someone to finding some other issues? Or, or what if we have it light up somewhere that isn't associated with pain, but it's in the periphery and, and it doesn't solve the problem? So there's still a lot of work that we have to do to actually get to the point where we believe this thing is, is totally, totally sure for pain diagnosis. Uh, and I, think I just showed you two cases out of 150, right? <laughs> so there's a lot of cases um, where we've been looking at, but we've been taking all comers with any kind of pain. So anything from endometrial pain to cancer pain, to bone cancer pain, um, to sciatica, uh, to chronic regional pain syndrome, which we don't diagnostic test for right now. So we've been looking at all kinds of things. And we've got many, many manuscripts that we've got put off to the side because we're trying to interpret all the data and make sure what we publish is we believe in and we feel good about. And so I think that's going to be the major test going forward. Where is the insurance going to fall and all that? At the end of the day, they're going to be the ultimate decider <laughs> of whether or not something like this goes forward. Right now, we're looking at a round, and I'm making a ballpark guess, but I think. Each dose in this trial is about six thousand dollars because it has to be synthesized on the spot, used, and then all the imaging time and everything else. Um, and so that cost has to come way, way down. Which it would if it gets into a more commercial aspect. Research is always much more expensive. I hope that answers. Did you have anything? Yes. Other questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, do you see any like real toxicity associated with Renal? Oh, sorry. Uh, renal toxicity is what you asked? But these ones, so far we have not. Um, but again, we're looking at uh, radioactive doses here. So uh, one thing I did explain uh, when, you're, when you're dosing these compounds and uh, imaging studies, you're actually dosing by radioactivity, not by milligram per kilogram, what we would do in a, in a pharmacological behavioral compound. So we're injecting probably then on the of variants of compounds in here. And I did mention we haven't seen any changes in clinical chemistries, but it's only a single dose. So we really don't know long term uh, what could happen, but it's a great question because you see how much of it is taken up in the uh, we do know that it's completely eliminated from the kidneys. Um, and if you look at the latter pictures, they were, they were also full uh, in the later years. So um, we, know that it's, we know that it's being eliminated there. And that'll be definitely an area that we can do therapeutic wise. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? Do we have questions? Well, I'd like to invite you to join us for a little section after the talk, uh, where we can talk about to our guests or to each other about everything we heard. So, join us in the back of this room. Thank you. Very much. Thank you all.